Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles. Wow, look at the time. Is it Friday already? It must be World of Tanks o'clock. This is, and I do love his name, a headless chicken. And unless I'm very much mistaken, which, let's face it, around here is always possible, he's taking the AT-15A out for a spin. Now, why on earth would you want to do that? Could it have anything to do with the mission that he's currently running? Concrete defence, which involves getting hit without being damaged or not. I think it might be. Because, and let's be honest here, you need a reason to play the AT-15A because it isn't really very good. I mean, it's not terrible, but... Well, it's not very good. The armor's alright, providing you're top tier. And he is top tier, and he's on a city map, this is Paris. So he's pretty much got the best possible map rotation and matchmaking to do well in this tier 7 British premium tank destroyer. Well, that doesn't explain why you think this is a not very good machine jingles. It does have good armour. It's also got a lot of health for a tier 7 tank destroyer, and the gun handling in the 17 pounder gun is just top notch. The accuracy, the rate of fire, everything's great. Yeah, not exactly. This is still just a 17 pounder gun, except it's in a tier 7 tank destroyer. This is, to all intents and purposes, the same 17 pounder gun that you get on the TOG 2, which is a tier 6 heavy. And while it is true that the gun has slightly better rate of fire, accuracy and aiming time than on the TOG 2, so it damn well should. This is a tier 7 tank destroyer, not a tier 6 heavy tank. You generally expect a significantly bigger gun upgrade than this when you go an upper tier and changing class from heavy to tank destroyer. But that, well that really isn't the case here with the AT-15A. Where this gun is excellent is in a often overlooked stat, and that's the firing arc of the gun. You can basically park this thing on a corner at a 45 degree angle and still be able to fire the gun down the road at targets to the left or the right. It's almost like the complete opposite of the French tank destroyers, which are fast, lightly armoured, and have very, very narrow firing arcs on their main gun. The complete opposite of this thing. And about that armour, it's true that this thing does have 228mm of frontal armour, which is astonishingly good for a tier 7 tank destroyer. But it doesn't have 228mm everywhere. It has two huge frontal weak spots on the upper plate below the gun, and the slit that the gun projects from is in fact a complete armour hole. There's no armour there whatsoever. This armour will, however, serve you well when you're fighting the stupids. Like that VK3601H who had no idea what to do, so he just pressed his 2 key and tried to buy his way out of trouble. Much in the same way that that P43 down there is also doing, although I'm not going to be too critical about the P43, he is just a tier 5 medium. And if you're not accurate enough to be able to hit the AT-15A's frontal weak spots at those kind of ranges, or if you just don't know where they are in the first place, most people are probably just going to do what he did, press their 2 key and try to buy their way through your armour. However, 228mm of frontal armour. If you don't know where to aim, not even premium ammunition on a P-43 is going to burn its way through that. So all things considered, I think the P-43's decision to run away is probably the right call. Hang on a minute. I've never played a P-43, okay, so I have no idea. Is that just a really bad slow tank? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> because a headless chicken is almost catching him in an AT-15A. Let me just... Oh, it does have two engine upgrades. Well, maybe he only had the 330 horsepower engine. I don't know. Speaking of things that defy explanation, watch this T-34S. We've just been shot on the flank from the rear. You've just been shot on the flank from the rear again. Backs up into cover. Smart move. Then immediately drives back out into the open to exactly the same spot where he just took two shots from the rear and the flank. Not entirely sure what his plan was there. Whatever it was, it didn't work. And oh look, there's the P-43 again. Proving that persistence will eventually pay off. Headless Chicken has just suffered his first damaging hit of the match. The Headless Chicken now has a problem. There's basically nobody down this end of the map but him and the P-43. And he only has that 228mm of P-43 premium ammo defeating armour at the front. 
which is why he's reversing away from the P43. He wants to get back into the action, but he could take a lot of damage if he turns his back on that Italian Tier 5 medium. Oh, hang on a minute. That is a very, very handy piece of rubble. It's almost as if it was put there for exactly this purpose. And good timing too, because a headless chicken is now the last tank left alive on his team. And since this thing has all the speed and maneuverability of a comatose brick, he's going to want the enemy to come to him if he's going to stand any chance of winning, because to win, the enemy team either have to kill him or they have to cap. And that's the capture point right in front of him. So if they try to win by capping, he's going to see them and he can kill them. And if they try to hunt him down and kill him, and they probably have a very good idea of where he is, thanks to the encounter with the P-43 earlier, he can't be outflanked and encircled, because he's got himself backed into a corner. So they're going to have to come at him from the front, one way or the other. So a headless chicken is basically backed up into this corner, asking the team, who's feeling brave? <laughs> come and have a go, if you think you're hard enough. He could still be in trouble. I mean, there are five of them. If two or more of them come at him at the same time from different directions, this could get quite sticky. On the plus side, he does have all of that armour, and he still has almost all of his health. But all they have to do is blow his tracks off. And there are two artillery in play, and hello, hello, hello. There's one of them. Oh, uh, he's not alone. Yeah, this is pretty much the worst thing that could have happened. He's going for the M44, and it's going to require three shots for him to... Yeah, I know, tier 7 tank destroyer gun, my fat ass. Three shots to kill a tier 6 artillery. But he has got him. Again, very, very good gun handling. Managed to kill it while on the move. P43's back, and appears to have run out of gold ammunition, which he is really going to regret. This chicken is ignoring him in order to get the kill on the Gorilla. P-43 backing off, and he's taking shots from the rear now, that's the VK-3001P. Managed to blow his tracks off, use the repair kit, and the VK is definitely the bigger threat. He's actually managing to do damage. And if we're assuming that the P-43 has actually blown all of his premium ammunition, he cannot damage a headless chicken from the front, unless he knows where to aim, and we're pretty sure he doesn't. He can't damage him from the side, pretty much anywhere. And there's only a couple of spots on the rear he's actually capable of penetrating his armour. In fact, even if he had his premium high explosive anti-tank ammunition, he would still only be able to reliably damage a headless chicken from the rear. And he is at least attempting to park himself on the rear of the tank, but this is where that excellent firing arc comes in again. He's able to angle against the VK's gun, and still fire at him and kill him. And now it's just him and the P-43, who I am sure has run out of premium ammo. Because if he had any left, he'd be firing it now. Except it's not a headless chicken versus the P-43, is it? There's also a GW Panther on the enemy team. And I think it's safe to assume that a headless chicken's been spotted for long enough for a machine as quick as a GW Panther to be able to relocate and start shooting. Ah, but jingles. If the GW Panther fires, he's probably going to kill the P-43 as well. True. But he'll also kill a headless chicken, and his team will win. Not that I'm advocating that oh, oh, Jingle said artillery should have fired and team killed. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that under the circumstances, it's an acceptable risk. You know, if you want to win. And yet the only thing we can say with any certainty about that GW Panther is whatever he's doing, he's taking a sweet time doing it. He is not actually AFK, by the way. He has a kill, and we are going to be seeing him later on in this match. But whatever he's doing right now, it doesn't involve trying to kill a headless chicken. Speaking of a headless chicken, how long do you think it's going to take for him to realise that all he needs to do to beat this P-43 is to back the tank up <laughs> and get something solid? Like, oh, I don't know, one of those buildings behind him. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering when he was going to think, oh, hang on a minute, my problem is the P-43 on my ass. I need to remove that P-43 from my ass by putting something else there that the P-43 can't get in between. And yeah, he did eventually figure it out. Well done. However, let's not all bake a cake and celebrate the victory just yet. 
still has to find and kill that GW Panther. And he doesn't have a huge amount of health. The GW Panther just has to hit him once. In fact, it, it's artillery. It doesn't even have to hit him. A near miss will be enough. And he's dead. And all of this has been for nothing. So he has... Well, he has three options here. He can drive around the map trying to find the GW Panther. And, well, there's still five minutes of the game left. It's an option. <laughs> it's a, probably a complete waste of time, but it is an option. Um, he could sit by his own cap, waiting for the GW Panther to try to cap, but, well... Yeah, that ship has already sailed. And since there is still just under five minutes of the game left, despite the fact that this is one of the slowest machines in creation, he does actually have time to get to the enemy cap, sit in it, and win by capping, if he has to. At this point, you could be forgiven for assuming that the GW Panther was in fact AFK. I mean, just because he has a kill doesn't mean that something hasn't happened, he had to answer the door, medical emergency, whatever. There are all kinds of reasons for people going AFK. The fact that he has just killed four enemy tanks without once getting a sniff of the GW Panther. You could be forgiven for assuming that he was in fact AFK. And so heading for the enemy cap, while this is going to broadcast your location to any surviving enemies, if you're working from the assumption that the last surviving enemy tank is AFK and hidden in the corner of the map somewhere, and you have time to cap, and he does have time to cap, this is the smart thing to do. At the same time, however, you shouldn't just assume that the last surviving enemy tank is AFK, because capping out is announcing your location to him. So, hope that he's AFK, but prepare for the possibility that he might not be. Spoiler alert, that GW Panther is not AFK. I don't know what he's been doing for the last five minutes. Top of his priority list was obviously not killing a headless chicken. He may have been AFK, but he's definitely back at the keyboard now. And he's rushing back to the cap circle to at least attempt to do something about it. The key word here, of course, being attempt, because don't let the fact that he has one kill fool you. He's actually only fired his gun four times, and he's only done 148 damage. And when you see how he makes an utter hash of trying to defend the cap like this... <laughs> That's probably not altogether surprising. That has got to be one of the easiest Kolobanov's medals I think I have ever seen. I mean, it did get a bit tricky about halfway through, and Headless Chicken did play well, made the most of the advantages in the machine. But I can't help but thinking, why can't we all have enemies like that? <laughs> At the same time, though, let's not get too judgmental. Um, about that GW Panther. It could have just been a five-year-old. It could have been somebody with a mental or physical disability just trying to do the best they could. It's still funny. <laughs> so I'm still having a damn good laugh about it, but hey, let's, uh, let's not judge. Anyway, moving along swiftly. Oh, wow, would you look at the time? It's KV2 o'clock. This is Gorgamoth and everybody's favourite Marxist-Leninist re-educator. I wanted to say that Gorgamoth had a mostly unremarkable game in his KV-2, but that's not true. Nobody has unremarkable games in the KV-2. There's always something remarkable happens. He had an unremarkable result, but it was punctuated by two, well, I was going to say remarkable events. But again, when you're in a KV-2, the remarkable becomes ordinary. Jingles, you're not making any sense. Put the crack pipe down and step away from the keyboard, son. It's probably easier if I just show you. There's a T-67 out there. How do you know that? Well, we don't, but that bush is looking at me funny. Let's put a shell into it and see what happens. And there you go. <laughs> T-67 was never spotted. He hadn't even fired. But the bush was looking very suspicious. The only thing better than one-shotting T-67s in the KV-2 is one-shotting T-67s that had never fired a shot in anger and never did anything to hurt you. It's not the only T-67 on the enemy team, however. There is another. And yes, the dead flak bus there, bearing testament to the fact that there's more than one very obvious sniping spot on this map. Oh no, we're taking hits from another T-67. How did he get around there? Where? Dunno, can't see him. Shoot the bush, just in case. Remember, kids? <laughs> if it's funny once, it's funny every time. 
Anyway, time to get serious. This is storage in the S-Tank, the Swedish Tier 10 tank destroyer. It's not a tank destroyer, it's a tank, said everybody in Sweden. Y yeah, yeah, I know that, you know that, everybody knows that, but, well, Wargaming apparently doesn't know that. Or maybe they do, but they just don't care. They're calling it a tank destroyer. Sorry, Sweden, you're just going to have to deal with it. It is a remarkable machine, both in real life and, to a large degree, here in World of Tanks as well. It has absolutely phenomenal gun handling. And the maneuverability is pretty much off the charts as well. As most of you are probably aware, this machine in real life could fight and move just as efficiently moving backwards as it could moving forwards. And to a large degree, you've got that represented here in the game. So, fantastic, and I really do mean just absolutely amazing gun handling and performance in this machine. And also, top-notch maneuverability. What's the catch? Well, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Most of you are probably completely aware of the whole siege mode thing in this machine. For those of you who aren't aware, maybe you haven't played World of Tanks in a long time, or maybe you've never played World of Tanks at all. What you have here with the S-Tank is a, a mechanic similar to the way siege artillery worked in StarCraft 2. You can't have it all, all of the time. If you want exceptional gun handling, press a key to activate siege mode, and the gun becomes amazing. But your maneuverability sucks. And if you want fantastic maneuverability, Press a key to activate mobility mode, and your maneuverability is off the charts. But the gun handling sucks. You can't have it all. Okay, seems like a fair compromise. What not to like about this thing? Ah, uh, that would be the armour. As you can see by looking at the shape of this thing, the frontal armour of this machine is sloped at such a ridiculous angle that you would just expect any shot that hits that to ricochet clean off without doing any damage. And that's pretty much what happens when you try to shoot at the front of this thing in real life. But World of Tanks isn't real life. In World of Tanks, we've got this thing called the Overmatch Mechanic. This machine has 40mm of frontal armour, which means an 81mm gun or higher will partially overmatch the frontal armour. And a 121mm gun or higher, so basically every gun on every Russian heavy tank <laughs> and most of the Chinese mediums as well, will go through that armour as if it wasn't there. Because that's what the overmatch mechanics do. As far as that calibre of shell is concerned, this tank doesn't have any armour. And it also doesn't have a lot of health. And 122mm guns do a lot of damage. And that's the problem with the S-Tank. The armour, such as it is, is amazing. And all the wrong tank fires at you, and then suddenly... Oh dear. Of course, it could be worse. You could be that guy in the UDES 3 who only has 30mm of frontal armour, which means even this 105mm gun penetrates it as if it wasn't there. He can hit that enemy Swedish tank destroyer anywhere, and it's always going to penetrate when firing armour piercing. Of course, the other problem is if you get hit with high explosive ammunition. Don't forget, Damage from high explosive shells is mitigated by the armour thickness, and this thing only has 40mm at the front uh, and 30 at the sides and rear, so yeah, you don't want to get shot at by high explosive shells in this thing either. Basically, you just don't want to get shot at when you're in this machine, because it's probably not going to work out too well for you, which is what makes what he's doing now all the more surprising. That's a Type 5 Heavy. You know what kind of gun that thing has, yeah? It's probably firing, oh crap, an Object 704. Right, he's caught between a bit of a rock and a hard place here, and that Type 5 Heavy can do 1400 high explosive damage. He missed! Right, that shot didn't even hit him. It missed and hit the rocks behind him, and the splash did nearly 500 damage. Of course, the Type 5 is now dead, because he's never going to get a second shot off. The S-Tank is always going to get two or even three shots off before that thing is going to reload. And again, this is a very, very, very bold move. But then again, he does know that the Object 704 has just killed the KV-4, so while it's a little risky, he is able to get a shot into the Object 704 and then take cover behind this very conveniently placed wrecked Type 5 Heavy. So, it's all good. This is fine. <laughs> Waiting for the Object 704 to focus its attention elsewhere. And he has just fired. Which is a good news, bad news situation, because it means he can now leave the cover, 
provided by the wreck of the Type 5 Heavy, but the Object 704 has just killed another tank, and now he only has two, count them, two surviving teammates against one, two, three, four, five, six, seven enemies? Yeah. And he only has 40 millimeters of armor, and he's already lost a third of his health, and he didn't have that much health to begin with, because he's in a Swedish tank destroyer. So what's his plan now? Well, I think his plan was to try to link up with and support the T-95. The T-95 can take a couple of hits, although he doesn't have a huge amount of health left, and he could maybe get a couple of shots into whatever was attacking the T-95, as long as the T-95 stayed alive. But that plan has just been scuppered by the T-49 who spotted him. Not quite sure why the T-49 persists in running away. I mean, he's got enough health to take a hit, and surely he knows that nest tank moving at this kind of speed isn't really much of a threat because the gun isn't going to hit anything. Then again, the T-49's gun isn't remarkably accurate either. But that T-95 definitely needs help. So he stops the tank, engages siege mode, and bounces off the object 704. He still has another shot though, maybe. Nope. Where did the T-49 go? And where's the rest of the enemy team? Well, there's one less on the enemy team to worry about because the Primo Victoria has just managed to kill the Conqueror Orbital Laser Cannon. So that's one less artillery to worry about. Oh, storage was spotted. I don't think it was the Object 704. Probably means the T-49 had spotted him and you don't want to be sitting still in siege mode with a T-49 aiming its 152mm howitzer at you. So back into mobility mode. Remember this thing goes just as fast in reverse as it does forward. Break line of sight, get into concealment. It's going to be bad news for the T-95 over there, however, that poor old Doom Turtle is almost certainly about to suffer from a serious case of T-49 up his backside. Or at least that's what you'd think, but still no sign of the T-49. Oh, hold on. That's a question we're going to have to puzzle out. In a future installment, IS-3 spotted. Now, it might just be a Tier 8 Soviet heavy tank, but it has a 122mm gun which means storage basically doesn't have any armor. Every time that... yep, there it is. Every time the IS-3 hits him, it is going to do damage. And the IS-3 is not making this easy because he at least knows enough to go hold down behind that ridge. Now about the S-Tank's armor... There is a 50mm strip either side of the gun. And if the IS-3 is unlucky enough to hit that, it is actually going to bounce. That was a spot of luck. <laughs> yeah, wasn't it? He still has to kill that IS-3 though, because he is now the last surviving tank on his team. The T-95 and the Primo Victoria are both dead, and you can guarantee that the rest of the enemy team are all making a beeline for this position. He's killed the IS-3. His problems are just beginning, because the Object 704 has a 152mm gun, and can overmatch even that 40mm of armour. Unless... he hits a tiny strip... <laughs> of 60mm armour, right at the bottom of the 50mm armour strip, which even the Object 704, at these kind of angles, is going to bounce on. So, yeah, that was kind of lucky too. <laughs> but hang on. Where did that T-49 go? I mean, talk about making an entrance. And I think Storinch's spider sense was tingling here. Because this side of the map has been quiet for far too long. Yep, there he is. Yeah, we see you. <laughs> Although this isn't actually good, because now he's got an Object 704 behind him. And he's got a T-49 in front of him. Now, the T-49 is actually the one that killed the Primo Victoria, and you can see that he took some damage doing it, so he's now a one-shot kill. T-49, not feeling particularly brave, runs away, and that gives Storinch the excuse that he needs. He engages mobility mode, and he starts backing the hell out of there. But while this thing is fast, with mobility mode engaged, not quite fast enough. He is going to have to stand and fight. And that VK-1001P is using the 128mm gun, although it's kind of comical that he's firing APCR gold ammunition at a machine that only has 60mm of armour at best. Importantly though, he's killed the Object 704. Even more importantly, he's managed to go undetected, because I don't know if you noticed, he was actually firing through a triple layer of bushes there, so he's gone unspotted, and he's able to attempt to get out of there, but he's foiled 
once again by that pesky T-49. So he's still going to have to stand and fight. Kills the VK, but the T-49 swoops in for the kill. Storinch bends over, grabs his ankles, prepares to kiss his ass goodbye, but the T-49 somehow manages to fuck it up. <laughs> Point blank range shot with the 152mm howitzer. Didn't even really have to hit him. <laughs> Still managed to miss by enough that even the splash damage did nothing. Storage, how are you still alive? Well, yeah, even a broken clock tells the right time twice a day. <laughs> I mean, there's, a, there's a certain amount of luck involved in every epic replay from World of Tanks that you see on YouTube. But let's not all go back to Storage's place for long soapy showers just yet. He still has to find and kill the shit bomb, which is nowhere near as shit as it used to be and is armed with a 183mm gun that would be entirely capable of instantly deleting Storage even if he was on full health. And he is very definitely no longer on full health. So the last thing that you want to see right now is Storage just kind of blundering around a corner and finding himself face to face with the shit barn and the gun pointing in this direction. And so naturally that's almost exactly what happens. Ah! Oh wait, no, he's facing the other way. Blow his tracks off because the ship barn's turret doesn't rotate 360 degrees, load the high explosive, aim for the back of the turret and hope he doesn't have a repair kit. Oh, hang on a minute. Nobody's that oblivious. Yeah, the ship barn's AFK. Which is a shame. And a great disservice to Storage because he did everything right. He immobilised him, he could have easily retracted him even if he'd had a repair kit. He loaded the high explosive and he aimed for the turret. These are all the things that you do when you find yourself in that kind of situation against an FV4005. So AFK or not, he still turned in a great performance and definitely deserved the win. Hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you to everybody who submitted their battles. And as always, take care and I'll catch you next time.